Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Alexander Brown. Two students sit alone at a lab bench. It's littered with scrap paper and electronic equipment. But it's 11 p.m. on a Friday night, and they're working on an assignment for my senior level control systems course. But the assignment was due almost two weeks ago, and the chance for a better grade, well, it's long gone. Now, their task was to control the speed of an electric motor using feedback, but all it does at the moment is alternate between making weird noises and spinning wildly out of control. So, what's wrong? Is it the circuit that they built to interface the microcontroller with the motor? Is it the lab bench power supply acting up? Did it blow a fuse? Is it an error in the code that they wrote, or is it something else entirely? This isn't even the first time they've tried to debug this thing. Two days ago, they put in 10 fruitless hours. They're frustrated, they're underwater, and they feel like they're drowning. And then panic sets in. They think, well, if we can't even get this motor running properly, how will we ever finish our final project? Their final project, a small tank-like robot that needs to follow a dark line at high speeds and avoid obstacles along the way, well, it seems way out of reach, right? At this point, even the smallest victories seem like they're not going to happen, right? Their success in this moment hinges on their ability to turn their current struggle and confusion and their past struggle into a path forward. They are capable, but it's their mindset that needs work. Now, these students feel like me, their professor. I kicked them out of a helicopter into the middle of the ocean. And you might agree with them. But if I did kick them out of a helicopter, it was with explicit instructions to look for the dinghy in their backpack as soon as they splashed down. I reassured them that they knew how to inflate this dinghy and that they have what it takes to paddle to shore. And it's important that the students react appropriately when they feel themselves sinking, because it's in those moments when we feel closest to giving up that we often have the best reasons to persist. As instructors, we want to acknowledge that the path to the surface can be long and arduous and frustrating, but that success lies, at least in my course, in the disciplined process of control system design, not in flailing around and not in blind experimentation. So, given the students' frustration, you might be asking, well, why would you put students in this position? You might say, you can't do this to students, especially pre-tenure. Um, now, granted, many control systems courses have some hands-on component and are much less frustrating. But often, what it looks like is students complete a sort of series of laboratory exercises, and they're kind of self-contained. And as instructors, we hope that those students will take what they learned in class and apply those things to the labs. But students don't always approach labs the way we'd like them to. Sometimes, they just want to get through it. They just want to get a good grade and move on and <laughs> kind of forget about it, right? But we want process-oriented students, not product-oriented students. We want students that do what we all do as engineers and entrepreneurial thinkers. When things get hard, we want them to know how to struggle, but effectively, to persist with purpose, and to be ready to learn from mistakes and setbacks instead of being afraid to make any, right? So we needed our students to have repeated safe opportunities to fail productively. We needed them to recognize for themselves the value in the theory that we were teaching them in class. So we needed them to change their mindset about the course. So our solution was that we rebuilt our entire control systems course around these three robot projects. They're cumulative, each one is more difficult than the last. And we scaffolded each of the key concepts required to complete each of these projects with lab experiences once per week and lecture assignments and homework assignments and reading assignments that were right around daily. And each one of these demanded the students return to the fundamentals over and over and over again. And gradually, we put the students in more and more challenging situations with less and less guidance, culminating in the final project. And we think this worked really well. But how do we know? Well, we've only been doing this for two years, but 
our anecdotal evidence is rather encouraging. For instance, one 2018 graduate wrote me this past summer saying that he got a control systems project from his bosses. And they thought it would keep him busy for a few months while they figured out what to do with him. But he was done with it in a week, and that was pretty cool. But I must say, reimagining our course this way was not without risk. We were worried that if we pushed the students too hard, they might give up. Worse yet, they might stage a mutiny and revolt against us. So the problem is, without the proper mindset, repeated failure and repeated struggle, it can be damaging rather than helpful. Right? So how did we work with the students on their mindset? What did the mechanics look like on the ground? Well, based on what I've told you so far, you might think, well, it sounds like the secret sauce was in the projects, and project-based learning, or PBL. And it's true, we did borrow a lot from PBL and project-based learning as we designed the course. But one thing that we were very careful about is in all the scaffolding, all the supporting lectures and reading assignments, we wanted to make sure that there was enough structure to show students that there were connections between what we were asking them to do in lab and what we were asking them to do on the projects. You know, it's actually kind of difficult to convince some students that they really need the more abstract and difficult concepts in control theory in order to succeed because those things are difficult, right? And in past versions of the course, we struggled with this a lot. We also found that in revising our lab handouts and our reading assignments in particular, we wanted to avoid giving students answers to questions they didn't even have, right? If we gave students answers to questions they didn't have, they probably wouldn't retain much. So we designed the assignments to generate the right questions, and a lot of times they were due even before we would discuss a concept in class. And we did this to practice the student's ability to turn their confusion about a piece of material into curiosity and motivation to learn new things. We did it to give them practice with being uncomfortable. And we did it so that they would learn to turn to the reading assignments and turn to the supporting material when they were stuck. But I submit to you that any one of these things alone, from that sort of flipped classroom model of assignments being due before class, to the problem-based approach of the projects, to the cumulative trajectory of the course, I don't think any one of those would have worked alone because we've tried these things in isolation without a whole lot of success. So what was different this time? Well, this time, our biggest change was how we addressed students in their most vulnerable moments. And this is key. Whenever a student would need an answer to a question, they were having an issue, they would beg us for answers, and generally we, we wouldn't give them what they were asking for. We would simply help them contextualize what they were seeing and feeling in terms of the concepts they needed to apply. Anytime they would say, well, I don't know how to do this, or I don't know what's wrong with this circuit, can you please help me? Um, our help that we would give them was the smallest push necessary to show them just that they know where to look and that they did know what the next step was going to be. And I'll say that Lafayette's meta mindset model, which is a graphical construct that illustrates the process of productive failure and productive struggle, was key for us in explaining to students where, we, where they were in this process. It helped us explain to them how to cast their past experiences in terms of their practiced creativity, their enduring understanding of course concepts, and the self-assessment tools that are built into the discipline of control system design. We explained to them how at every turn in the course, they'd be presented with new and increasingly difficult opportunities and challenges, and how to make the most of each of these, they would need to see the connections between what they had done before and what we were asking them to do now. They'd have to see how those things intersected. We talked to them extensively about how to know whether a risk they took with an assumption or a calculation or a design decision was actually deliberate and not just a wild grab. And this was key because we wanted them to be able to build a skill set to take the intrinsic value from all of their past experiences, whether positive or not, and use that to conquer their next challenge. But we did not try to remove the pain and frustration from this process, and that's very important. Because we all know this, sometimes getting an experiment to match theoretical predictions is, is difficult, and it's painful, and it's frustrating, and it takes a lot of work. But sometimes that pain and frustration is actually an integral part of our success. So let's think back to those two students alone at 11 p.m. in the lab. How does their night end? Well, they're actually fairly methodical. They check the power to their microcontroller. They make sure everything's got power. 
They check the inputs and outputs of their circuit to make sure that the microcontroller is talking to the motor properly. And they print diagnostic information from their code to the serial monitor. And that's when they see something. The control signal is way too large. This leads them all the way back to the very beginning of their design calculations where they find an extra factor of two. They forgot to divide by the magnitude of their input when they were building their model. And suddenly the cloud's clear. The motor's humming along at exactly the right speed. All that pain and frustration over what amounted to changing one number in one line of code. They put their heads down on the table. They groan. They're exhausted. It's almost midnight. Finally, after a long pause, one says to the other, well, I don't know. You ready to start working on this robot project? OK, let's do this, is the reply. They know that the end of that lab is not an ending at all. They're still underwater. They're still uncomfortable. But the panic is gone, and they begin to swim upwards. Thank you. <laughs>